morning, church family. My name is Chase Stinson. I'm a senior in our youth group. And as we begin worship today, let's read responsively. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's add our voice, not just congregationally reading, but let's sing as well this great hymn, this foundational hymn of our faith, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's hymn number eight. Standing wherever you are, let's sing.
aren't you grateful for God's mercy? Grateful for his mercy in your life individually and our life corporately as a body of Christ. We need the mercy of God. As we gather in worship today, he's not just called you individually, he's called us corporately. So let's just take a moment to stand and welcome those around us that have come to worship with you as this family of Christ. If you're welcome, worshiping with us at home, welcome. We are so grateful to have you with us. What's happening here is happening in your home, and we've prayed for you. God bless you. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Welcome to the First Baptist Church of San Antonio. We are grateful that you can worship with us today. Thank you for those who could be in the room today, and thank you for those of you watching on TV this morning. Uh, we're grateful that you're worshiping with us. Uh, we would say if you're worshiping with, with us on television, we would love to get to know you, and the way we do that is through our online Connect Here card, and you can find that on our website at fbcsa.org slash connect here. So if you would go on there, we would we'd love to get to know your name, and that's how we do it uh, through the television. If you're in the room, the way we do it are these cards that look like this. They should be in the pew back in front of you. If you would take one of those and give us your name and put it uh, in the offering boxes uh, as you leave, uh, we would be grateful. Now, let me, let me begin. I know we, we find great joy with uh, our youth singing and what a beautiful thing that is. And even in the midst of the beautiful voices of our youth, uh, you may sense some sorrow in the air. Uh, this week has been a difficult week in the life of this church. Uh, in fact, um, last Sunday uh, after worship, there was a tragic death of a church member. And we have been processing that grief all week long. And in a similar way, after Wednesday night, um, there was another church member here who was here Wednesday night who had a, tr a stroke Thursday morning who has since passed away. And so we've had a great grief this week in, in dealing with both of those, and they've hit uh, close to home. And so this week, we have been a church in mourning. But, you know, I'll, I'll say, and what we've recognized through this, is when you go through difficult days like this, you get to see the beauty of the church. In fact, it was uh, remarkable to see how the church responded uh, in these deaths. So I want to say, one, thank you for being a loving and gracious church, ministering um, across the city in all kinds of ways, even in death. Thank you. Thank you for serving that way. And I want to say, too, I'm also grateful because Scripture does not shy away from this. And, in fact, the best place for us to talk about death is in church. In church is where we know and find hope in death. In church, we come and we talk about resurrection alongside death. In church, we recognize that our Lord is with us through the most painful moments of life, walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death, so that we fear no evil, but our Lord's rod and staff, they comfort us. And in fact, Scripture tells us when we get to the Beatitudes that God comforts those who mourn. And so this morning, we have already seen and known His Spirit comforting us in our mourning these deaths. And so for that, we, we say thank you to the Lord. In fact, we look up and we worship Him and we say praise the Lord. We have a loving God who comes and ministers to us by His Spirit in the deepest of pain. And so let us worship well. In fact, let us look up and rejoice because we know our God is good. And we will proclaim that until Jesus Christ comes again or our own deaths. We will say our God is good and His loving kindness endures forever. So let us pray as we continue in worship. Our Lord, we know that you have overcome death, that at the crucifixion you faced death head on, and three days later you were raised again, a resurrection that foreshadows our own. 
in this life and the next. Lord, how you come and we die to ourselves and you make us new. Lord, how in eternity you will raise us up in new life, in new bodies. And so, Lord, we say thank you. And we, we, we patiently uh, anticipate what's coming next in worship. And in fact, Lord, as we come to this time and, and we lift up our voices to you, Lord, we pray that you'd be blessed by it. Lord, in, in, in the same breath, your spirit would come and sweep through this place and comfort us and, and build us up and encourage us as only you can do in your spirit. Lord, come and move in this time. It is yours. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm going to be reading from Luke 12, 16 through 20. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my bards and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? How many of you are grateful for a multi-generational church? I know I am. What a privilege to be led this morning with our youth. Um, as we begin singing today, you'll notice behind me is an empty loft. Um, please note that if you're sitting by someone in your pew that is of the worship ministry, they're not scouting for me. They're not trying to... <laughs> Although, I won't turn a recommendation down. I wanted, I wanted the church just to sing with one voice today, to hear us proclaim all throughout worship together how good our God is and how worthy he is of our, of, of our praise. So as we do, we will start with For All the Saints. We, what a great legacy we have that we stand on the shoulders of giants and that someday our children and their children will look back and say, what a privilege that we got to be led by you. So standing together, everyone, hymn 355, For All the Saints.
seated children, come down and meet me on these steps. Oh, come on down, everybody. Good. Yeah, come on down, come on down. Good morning, good morning. Are y'all racing? Yeah. Good job, good job. Did you win? Yep. Good job. Good job. I beat him. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see y'all this morning. Come on down, come on down. Good morning. Good morning, come on. Come on down, everybody. It's good to see you. Yeah, come, come, in. come on, come on, come on, come on. You're almost here. There you go. Good morning. All right. Let me let me ask you a couple of questions. So, first question: Has any of you ever put any thought into what you might be when you grow up? Yeah. Have you thought about it? What do you What do you think you might want to be when you grow up? Has anybody anybody you thought? I yeah. want to be. A missionary. A missionary. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's right. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be an animal master. An animal's master. Like like at the zoo or something like that? Or just like you want to have a pet? Yeah. Yeah, that would be good. What, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a vet. A veterinarian? Ooh, that would be a fun one too. Give me a couple more. What do you, what do you want to be when you grow up, do you think? What do you want to be? Vet. A what? A mom. That's a good one, too. What do you want to be, Riley? What do you want to be? A vet. A vet? You want to be a vet, too? Good. Anybody else? What do you want to be when you grow up? Actually, I want to be a, a veterinarian. You want to be a veterinarian, too? It's getting contagious. It's getting contagious. <laughs> yep. I want to work at Disney World. Work at Disney World. Ooh, that would be fun, too. That would be a good place to work. All right, let me ask you another question. What, when I was your age, what do you think I wanted to be? Do you, do you have any thoughts? What do you, uh, not quite pastor yet. <laughs> I, I wasn't quite dreaming of pastor or missionary when I was your age, but what do you think? A musician? No, I'm a terrible musician. That was not it either. What did you think? I, uh, uh, teacher. A teacher? Not quite. I'll tell you, there were two things that I wanted to be when I was your age. One of those, I wanted to be a football player. That didn't pan out though. <laughs> And the other, see, this is what I thought, this, I thought this is what everybody wanted me to be. So the other side of that, I thought, well, if I don't, if I'm not going to be a football player, I'll need to be a doctor because that's what everybody says you're supposed to be. So that was my other, so that was kind of my fallback. But then as I started growing a little bit older and as I started to pray, I felt like the Lord was leading me to be a pastor. So I actually, I, I felt the Lord lead me to be a pastor when I was a senior in high school. So when I was about 17 years old, I felt like God was calling me to be a pastor. Now, I tell you all this because we make plans and sometimes we think about what we want to be. You know, I thought I want to be a football player or I thought I want to be a doctor or something like that. But when, we, when we're making plans, it's always best to go to Jesus first and ask Jesus what he thinks. Because Jesus has a perfect plan for each and every one of you in your life. Sometimes that's being a missionary. Sometimes it's being a veterinarian. Sometimes that's being a doctor. Sometimes that's being a football player. We don't know what those are, but... Jesus will help us find the exact perfect place we need to be and who he's called us to be and who he's equipped us to be. And I, I promise be a scientist. you want to be a scientist and God can help you be a scientist to the best of your ability too. And that's what we need to pray about is just pray that God will help you see your gifts and who he's called you to be. For every single one of you, God has a place and a plan for you, a job for you and a family for you that's in store. And God is going to help you find exactly where you need to be. And so maybe you'll be a veterinarian or maybe something God, God has something else even greater in store for you. And so what we need to do is make sure we're praying. And as we're making plans and as we're dreaming about what's next and what we might do, we always need to ask Jesus first. And I'm going to talk about that in the sermon today too, okay? So listen in the sermon for how we might do that with Jesus and how we might ask Jesus, okay? All right, let's pray and we'll go. Father, we're grateful that you have placed a call on each one of our lives. Lord, that you give us gifts and you show us a way forward. And Lord, I pray for each one of these students that you would show them your grace. Lord, that you would build them up into great men and women of God. And Lord, they would serve you all across this world in all kinds of occupations. And Lord, that every one of us would be a missionary no matter what we're called to do for our job. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Good job. <laughs> Pastor, yes, <laughs> my daughter said musician, and you are a fine musician. <laughs> uh, we should, 
all all get to worship by Pastor Chris at some point. It is it is a privilege. So don't let anybody tell you differently. So we're going to put those skills to the test now. With everybody else, we're going to sing right now, day by day, and with each passing moment. And then we're going to follow that right up with sing praise to God who reigns above. So stand up, everyone, and let's let's sing together.
prepare to read from the Word of God. Amen. If you would turn with me to our reverse text for today, we're going to read aloud together uh, the whole of it, uh, James 4, 13 through 17. This then is the text for today. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, this week, Lord willing, Amy and I will have our third daughter on Tuesday. Yeah, that's a blessing. You see, we've had, we've had to be careful planning. I, I've kept thinking all week, the Lord with this text, in his humor, uh, would send, send Amy into labor this morning and Pastor Aaron was going to have to preach. But uh, as it is, the grace of God has allowed Amy to continue on, and Juliet will come another day. So we actually, uh, you know, you don't, these are things you don't normally plan. It does go well with this week's text. Um, but as it is, we have had to do some planning here, and Amy will have a, a C-section Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. And so, uh, Lord willing, we will have Juliet that day. And so we're grateful for that. Now, as it is with this text in James, you see, as this text unfolds, um, it cuts pretty deeply. You know, those of us uh, like myself who are planners, um, we're going to get our toes stepped on a little bit today uh, with this text. But let's not run too far in that direction because, you know, there's, there's another matter we must attend to first because even those who don't plan will find their toes stepped on today. Because, you know, you could read this passage that we just read aloud together and, and see this and sense this as a breath of fresh air for those who don't plan. You see, if you're not a planner, it's, it's wonderful to hear that you shouldn't or to hear in this text, maybe I shouldn't be about planning anything that I don't have to worry about tomorrow, I don't have to plan tomorrow, I don't have to worry about my future, to just live my life. But, but let's, let's focus in here. Because some of us have attempted to use this passage as an excuse to do nothing. And I will tell you the call of Jesus Christ on your life is not to live a life of nothing, but to live a life of value and worth. We can't use this passage to do nothing. In fact, we can't even use this passage not to plan, because if we did, this would be a misappropriation of God's Word. And, and far too often we have seen uh, folks who have taken God's Word and use it to justify their own actions and justify their own faults. May we not do that in this place, and may we not do that with this text. Because this passage is not here to give you permission to ignore your responsibilities. This passage is not permission to not plan. This passage is, is, is not permission to lay on your couch and drink a soda instead of getting the things done that need to get done. See, this passage is not meant to justify inaction, but to codify perfect action. That's what we're looking for. That your, your responsibility is to follow God in perfect obedience. And this passage is an ever-present reminder that God has much for you to do. God has much for you to be about. God has a great plan in store for your life. And often in the flesh, we find ourselves either ignoring that call, laying on the couch, or we go the other direction and we fill up our schedule to the point that we look up to God and we opine that we're so busy and we're so busy we can't carry out the mission that God has called us to do. You know, one of my favorite authors is a man by the name of Eugene Peterson. Uh, he wrote a very formative book for me called The Contemplative Pastor. And at one point in the book, he says something very provocative. 
Uh, he notes uh, like this. He says, if you hear your pastor ever say, I'm too busy, you should hear that like your pastor saying, I'm having an affair. And he says, forgive me, this is what he means by it. He says, if your pastor says, I'm too busy, they often mean one of two things by that statement. He says, often what we mean by that is sometimes pastors like to feel important. And so we, we like to tell people that our schedule is full of big, important things, and we have a big, important schedule, and it's so full of those big, important things, we have no time. Or the exact opposite happens where sometimes if a pastor says, I'm too busy, he has completely lost control of his schedule and it's going to destroy him. One way or the other, Eugene Peterson says, almost always, I'm too busy is a red flag. Now, Peterson is admonishing pastors here, but the truth remains the same for all of us. Usually, that I'm too busy line is either a fraudulent attempt to feign importance or this is an admission that you haven't examined your priorities recently, that we look up to God himself and say, oh God, I'm too busy. See, we can't pretend that we're too busy to be about God's business. Think of it this way. So, this month around the office, uh, October, is our month where we do our annual evaluations. Everybody gets evaluated. All the employees uh, go over with their supervisor the, the last year's performance. Um, and just for your information, Cody Knowlton, I think he's sitting right over there, is our deacon chairman, uh, and the deacon chairman does my evaluation for the year, and actually Cody and I will do mine tomorrow. And so what if... You come to your evaluation time and tell your boss that you've been too busy all year long to get anything done on your job description. What would your boss tell you if you walked into their office and you look over your responsibilities and you hadn't done any of them? You say, well, I, I was too busy. What would your boss do? A, a reprimand? A performance improvement plan? W w would they fire you? And, and I'm not asking this be for anyone on staff. I'm asking this because this is often how we treat our God, where he sets life before us, a good and holy and perfect life, and we say, God, I'm too busy for that kind of thing. You see, God has a work for us in his kingdom, a, a place for you to serve, a place for you to use your gifts and your talents, that, that God, God has set you up for success, and he's given you unique opportunity to minister through your gifts and your connections and your circles and your ways and your occupation where God has set before you great missionary work wherever you find yourself. And beyond that, God, as we see, has unfolded in Scripture and unfolded for this church. God has given us specific instructions for each one of us, instructions like to be repentant, instructions like you should be witnessing, you should be sharing the gospel with someone in your life this year. You, you should be discipling somebody this year. This is laid out in Scripture as clear calls as a part of who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ, to be repentant, to be someone who witnesses, to be someone who disciples. And we look up to Jesus and we say, well, I'm, I'm too busy. My schedule's too full for these kinds of things. You know, as we look over at this too, it, it all comes back to the relationship where God's saying in, in all of this, the, the, the greatest part of this life, as brief as it is, is your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing and the pivotal thing that we make time for is that relationship. It's about building it up with the Christ. And most of the year is filled up with all kinds of other things because we're too bus busy elsewhere or we're too lazy to actually get up and do something. But I do want us to be careful with those statements because this isn't about the do's and the don'ts. That's easy. If, if life and spirituality were about a list of, of do's or do nots, th th those, are, those are easy. They're digestible. And, and frequently what we do is we find that they're filled with loopholes when our legalistic minds get going in those. 
And that's why we have to recognize in this passage, the, the reality of this passage, as well as the whole of Scripture, is that this life is about a relationship with God. It, it doesn't really matter where your schedule lands, so as long as you're building and working through that intimate relationship with our God above. Because our God is an, an intimate God who, who gets his hands dirty in the dust of the earth as he creates you and as he has built you up. And in this intimacy, God is expecting a, a marriage-like relationship with you where you're in communication and you're loving on one another and you're spending time together with one another. And, and this becomes the most important aspect of our lives, that the two of you together and for all of it. And, you know, it's, it's hard because there's, there's some of us, like myself, who love a good schedule. And, and people like myself who want everything down on paper. And people like me will schedule things out to the minute. You know, Amy will tell, this, tell you this about me, that I always keep a strict schedule. And I am uneasy and uncomfortable when my schedule um, gets off track. In fact, she will tell you that if, if I am one minute late, my stomach starts to turn. Like I, I have physical response to being a single minute late or my, my schedule being a minute off. I get really uncomfortable. And you see, what this means for me is that I'm always going to try to manipulate my schedule so that there are no surprises on the horizon. But let me tell you something. Being in a relationship brings surprises. And bring, being in a relationship welcomes surprises. You know, but I often want to know how I'm going to spend every hour of my day. And, and I've seen it play out, even this very week, but I've seen it play out often that it doesn't matter how much time and energy goes into my schedule. Something always comes up that I've missed or so, something always comes up that I've never seen coming. And as much as I would like to think that I'm in control of my schedule, it all hangs in the balance day in and day out and can quickly fall apart. You know, as James warns us here in James chapter 4, this is all out of arrogance. When, when we look towards tomorrow and we prognosticate about what's going to happen or even write down on our schedules what we think to happen, we're playing with fire because we have some idea but we never know the whole picture. You know, it's interesting. James, James gives us, a, a, a singles out here, a particular motivation for planning. I, I hope you caught it as you studied in reverse this week because James notes here that most of us plan our schedule around our paycheck. That uh, whatever we must do to get the most money, that's what we're going to put down on our schedule. Uh, whether that's uh, keeping to a work schedule or like as he talks about here in the text, something like traveling so that a new deal might arise and profits will soar. Most of us put our schedules down on paper to maximize how much we might earn. That, that life is about earning potential and life is about amassing much and, and life is about retirement accounts and bank accounts and, and whatever else we can throw on top of it, barns and stables. And that's what we schedule towards. That's what we work towards. And James is warning us. He's saying here in this text, this is a terrible motivation. In fact, this is an unholy motivation because everything that you earn will be burned. None of it's going to last. In fact, why does your entire schedule revolve around your work life? Why does your entire schedule revolve around your next paycheck and when and where it might come from? He's saying there is a better way to this. And, and so don't think about this, this passage as forbidding you to plan, and don't even think about this passage as forbidding you to profit, because that's not what it's saying. It's not saying you can't profit. It's not saying you can't plan. In fact, we should, and we do. But he's saying you recognize first and foremost your relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior, and let him speak into every one of those moments and every second of every day and every dollar you might bring in, because Jesus is the one who will lead you in the way forward that is best for you. You see, we need to find that this scripture is pointing us to the relationship. You know, we all like to look at what's going on in our lives, you know, this week. 
And, and we like to look at the schedule and, and see what's going to happen and where this is going to go. We like to, to say, well, the C-section is going to be at 7 a.m. Tuesday morning. That's a wonderful thing for a planner like me. Just get it in. <laughs> Lord willing that you never know what the Lord might do. You know, we like to, we like to look at Thanksgiving and say, we've, we've got three weeks until Thanksgiving. What are all of the things that are going to happen before Thanksgiving? Christmas at first is coming. How long is Christmas at first? Five weeks, something like that? We like to know, and we like to plan, and we like to put it on paper. But Scripture is reminding us here that if you know Jesus Christ, you, you have this in. And in fact, you, you, you have this, this in and this wisdom and this authority that's not available anywhere else other than in Jesus Christ. And if you go before Jesus first, and if you run down your schedule with Jesus, life is going to be so much better than you could ever do on your own. You will always be better off when Jesus Christ signs off on your schedule. How many of us have ever taken the time to have Jesus sign off on our schedule? Because you have no clue what's going to happen between now and Tuesday. I have no clue what's going to happen between now and Tuesday. You have no clue what's going to happen between now and Thanksgiving. You have no clue what's going to happen between now and Christmas, but Jesus Christ does. And he loves you, and he's going to show you the way through all of it. Because you have no clue whether or not this pandemic will continue to wreak havoc at Christmas time. You have no clue what the stock market's going to do. You, you have no clue what international politicians might come up with this week. There are so many variables out there that you have no control over whatsoever. But that, that we have no fear of any of those things. In Jesus Christ, we fear none of it because Jesus Christ is in control of all of it. You see, for those who know Jesus Christ, those kinds of things don't matter whatsoever because we're not in control but we know the one who is. And though we cannot see the future, we know the one who does. And God has already ordained it. God has seen it. God has known it. God knows what is coming. And he is preparing us even today for what might come next week. You see, what we recognize in, in a text like this, that this, this life and all that is in it and all that we plan and all that we set forth is about a relationship with the Lord our God above. It is about a relationship ever deepening with Jesus Christ who has every answer. You don't, but he does. And in fact, what we recognize is that you can't do this alone. You know, so many times we get, we get caught up in the pain of this world. We get tripped up even in our own schedules because... We have this lie that we have to run at this by ourselves. But you don't. You're not in this alone. You, you have the Holy Spirit with you in Jesus Christ that he knows the way forward. And you have a church with you that walks forward knowing that we're in this together and we're going to move forward together no matter what this world throws at us. You see, it makes no sense for us to plan our days without first asking God for permission. In fact, when we plan our days without first asking God for permission, it is arrogance, it is boastful, sinful to think we might know what will happen tomorrow. We need to leave room for the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's this old line that, that we used in youth ministry as it was when you had an event with all your students, especially the ones that were dating, and when there would be too much public display of affection and two dating students would come towards one another, some would often say, you need to leave some room for the Holy Spirit between the two of you. <laughs> I will say, some of us need to leave some room for the Holy Spirit in our schedules. You know, we go all about the day planning, completely neglecting the fact that we are in a relationship with, with the Lord of the universe, with whom we should always ask permission before we do anything. And not because he's a tyrant, but because he is a graceful, all-knowing Lord who wants to help and build you up and show you a way forward that's better than anything you've ever known in this life. You see, his grace will set a course greater than anything you could create. 
And so let us follow the Lord's schedule and not our own. Whatever he's calling you today, let's be about that instead of whatever we imagined on our own. If he's calling you into a relationship with him, get on your knees and let's get there quickly. Say, I am with you, Lord. He's calling you obedience and service. Let's just run there as fast as we can, immediately seeking out the ways of the Lord. Because his ways and his schedule and his purposes are always greater than our own. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we are um, completely at a loss. We, we have nothing. We know nothing. But, Father, you are everything, and you, you see everything. Lord, we try to anticipate things that are coming next, but only you know what those might be. Lord, we often fear and run from death, but we know you bring resurrection. And so, Lord, today here is, is broken people. We come before your, you, our Savior, and say, forgive us and heal us. And, Lord, give us a schedule that is perfect. Lord, we pray that even today, we would recognize it's you in control, uh, not us. And that we serve a gracious king who's going to show us the way forward. It's in the name of our Lord and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to have our time of response now, uh, as we do every week. Um, this is your time. You can come down and pray. If you want to come, come pray. I'll, I'll be down here. If you want to come visit with me, we can, we can do that. We can, we can pray uh, together. If you want to talk about accepting Christ or being a part of this church, we can talk about those things. Um, maybe you need to sing or um, there's some things listed on your listening sheet. Maybe you need to respond in one of those ways. But however the Lord is calling you to respond, uh, let us respond this morning. So let's stand and let's sing.
play, but if you'll be seated and just continue in an attitude of response, God has spoken to you today. He has called you to something. It is our responsibility as believers to say yes to whatever he's called us to do. So as Jennifer continues to play, you just consider what the Lord has for you today and has for this church. God bless you. Thank you for worshiping with us today.